Good morning, church. Welcome to our service this morning and our time of worship together. Uh, we have a lot going on today, so our service is probably going to run over a little bit. Um, uh, the times I've gotten you out early, we're going to add those to the end, and we'll all be square when it's all said and done today. Um, but there are several things we need to um, uh, take care of. First of all, as you notice, we have our boxes over here for the Operation Christmas Child. And um, it is something we do on an annual uh, basis. Um, and so this morning, what we'd like to do is play a video to uh, help you kind of see uh, where these go and the impact that they have on the lives of the children who receive them. So Michael. <laughs> the kids are playing, are laughing, joyful. It's like a whole world to them. Because for the first time, they have received this precious gift. The message through the box is not only the toys that makes them smile. The message here is that Jesus loves them. You've got an army of volunteers that pack the boxes. They're helping OCC to take the gospel literally to millions of children. We are opening doors for other churches and other parts of the world to do ministry in their local community. They receive a box and also an invitation to come back and learn more about Christ. We just don't want to just hand out a box and stop there. We want them to grow in their faith. So it started with a box and it's ending with communities and countries being changed. With the sound so full, it ceases to amaze me how a simple box can change the world for a child. Thousands will be impacted by just one gift. You know, in our nation in which uh, our children are bombarded with gifts that it's amazing to think about a, a, a place in our world that still exists in which this may be the only connection that, of something that's given to a child in a whole year or maybe in a whole lifetime. We don't know that they go back into the same areas or not. So if you want to participate in that, <clears throat> excuse me, the boxes are over here. Uh, pick one up. Uh, I think there's instructions on how to take care of all of that and uh, fill it, bring it back. Um, I believe it needs to be back in two weeks, so uh, we can have that. You should have gotten a letter this week with uh, information on our stewardship campaign. This is in the time of the year where our congregation is, um, is asked to uh, help our session uh, with uh, what, what their intentions are in supporting the church in the next year. And so this morning from the session, uh, Lynn Yarnell is going to be talking to you about our stewardship segregate this space, this time, separated unto God, and allow uh, our hearts and our minds to shut everything out that's happened before, what will come after, and allow ourselves just to be in the presence of God today, instruments of worship and recipients of God's grace through the communion and through the word of God. If you have, do not have a prayer that you uh, can pray, uh, there is one for you in the bulletin. Let us spend a moment to prepare ourselves. Amen. The eternal Father who loved us and set us free from our sins, who loves us still with that love that will not let us go and who will love us forever, calls us to worship him today as the only true lover of our souls. 
The Lord stoops to receive the love of our poor hearts. He calls us to remember the depth of his love for us in Christ. God seeks our love. And To the one true God be praised in all times and places through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Welcome from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May grace and peace be with you in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Please join me responsively as we read from Psalm 32. Oh what, a, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, joy for those who the Lord When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. For you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble. You surround me with songs of victory. Many sorrows come to the wicked, but unfailing love surrounds those who trust the Lord.
The psalmist testifies, happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Happy are those to whom the Lord imputes no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. Trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now let us bring our prayers of confession to him. Amen. While it is true that we have sinned, it is a greater truth that we are forgiven through God's love in Jesus Christ. To all who humbly seek the mercy of God, I say, in Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. In response to this great gift and the peace that it brings, let us share God's peace with one another.
Would you bow your heads with me and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity, not only to worship you, but to sit at the feet of our Savior, our Lord, and to hear the words of God. Teach us today. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand that which is written for us. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our text today comes to us from Acts 16. It is part of a larger story, and again, I'm only going to read a part of it today, and then I'll fill in the rest of the story. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all of the doors were opened everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out of the prison, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, and all of his family. And then he brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. This is the word of the Lord. Well, from this point on in the book of Acts, in our studies, Luke is going to focus on the Apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus, who we went through the conversion with in our previous studies, is now emerged as an apostle apostle to the Gentiles. There's also a noticeable switch that goes on, and it'll actually happen in our text if we were to read, have read the whole thing today, and that is that Luke begins to speak as he's writing this, not from somebody informing us of decisions that were happening over here, but he uses the word we. He is now a party to what is going on, and so we'll see kind of how all of that kind of fits into what we want to say today. Paul has a desire to spread the gospel. It's amazing that the Hebrew of all Hebrews, the one who is the Pharisaic Jew, the one who is opposing the church in the very beginning because it is somehow softening the Jewish stand or what has always been known in the Jewish faith from the word of God, that is somehow distorting that. He has gone from the person that's persecuting that to the champion of the faith to a group of people who have never been included in the faith, to the Gentiles. He is relentless. He has a desire to spread the gospel. And it takes him north, and then it takes him west to an area called Phrygia, and then into the region of Galatia. It is up into the north area from where he had been located. And he desires to go farther into Asia when the Spirit of God says to him, no. So he turns and then he heads farther north, due north, into northern Turkey. And as he is about ready to set up camp there, the Spirit speaks to him again and says, No! So he travels down around and he comes to a city by the name of Troas. Troas is the place where the scholars believe that Luke was, was, was located, and it is there that Luke the author of the book of Acts, joins up with Paul and Silas and Timothy. So the four of them form this party. There may be others with it. But from this point on, Luke is sharing things that he is seeing firsthand. We is always the, the, the common word that he is using. And at that point then, Paul has a vision. And in the vision, there is a Macedonian, old Macedonian kingdom, and a person saying, come. So Paul packs his bags from Troas 
and he heads to a city called Philippi. We believe that Philippi is the home of Luke, who wrote the book of Acts. It is interesting because in all of that meandering that he did, there are several, several hundred miles that he traveled on foot. So I want you to think in terms of this morning, here is someone who is devoted to the gospel and who is traveling on foot in a direction and he kind of gets there and the spirit says, no, this isn't the place. So then he moves in another direction and as he gets there, the spirit says, nah, this isn't the place. So he goes to another place and there the spirit says, you need to go over here. Several hundred miles by foot. I was reading that and I was thinking it was like Julie giving me directions on how to get somewhere. You just kind of go here and then you go there and then you go somewhere else and then hopefully you arrive. But he did it on foot. Wasn't it like he was in a car traveling several hundred miles? I get upset if I have a detour that takes me 10 miles out of my way. Finally arrives at Philippi, which is a very interesting place. Philippi is, as we say, a Greek place. It is a Greek city of renown. It is a place where Rome took soldiers that had served in the Roman army and stationed them some of them after retirement. It was a Roman outpost. It was very Roman. In fact, it was so Roman, that even though it was Greek, in the Greek area of the world, it was given a status of, of, of an Italian city. It was known as a little piece of Rome in the foreign outpost of an area known as Greece. There is no Jewish presence there. There is no synagogue for Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke to go to. And so without a Jewish presence and without a synagogue, really a totally, a totally Roman-based Greek city, Paul and Silas head down by a riverbank where they hear about some women who are kind of worshiping God. They're called God-fearers. They, they have a pension towards God. There's something different about them than the average pagan or the average person who worships in the Roman culture. There they meet a woman by the name of Lydia. She is a woman of considerable means. She sells purple cloth, which is a very high-ranking profession, and she probably made a significant amount of money. And as they're there, and they share what they know to be the gospel, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he has died and been raised again. She comes to faith in Christ and believes. She insists that they come back to her home and they set up her home as an outpost. That's where they camped out. They weren't staying in an inn somewhere or whatever. They lived in Lydia's home. She had enough means and she was well known enough that she could support them as they made their daily excursions into the city of Philippi to share the gospel to a culture that had no presence of the gospel prior to this. Now imagine, normally the routine of Paul is to go and find a Jewish synagogue where at least there's some mention or some understanding of the faith. There's something to connect to. You can connect to Moses. You can connect to Abraham. You can connect over here to David, you could make all these connections. Now they're in a city in which there are none of those connections. So every day, they're going into Philippi, probably to reason with the citizens and present what was a Jewish Messiah as the savior of the whole world. On one of their journeys in, there is a slave girl she is possessed with a spirit, a python spirit. And she is an oracle. She is probably uh, somewhat spun off of some of the pagan temples there. But she speaks as an oracle. She has the ability to see into the spirit realm. Understand probably some of the future. She makes her living telling the fortunes of others and revealing spiritual secrets. She is owned by a syndicate or a mob. There's a group of people that own her. I, 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 would, I would use the term mob uh, uh, like, like we would understand the mob today. She is, she is owned. She's a slave girl. Somebody paid money for her. 
and she is making them a lot of money. Not unlike somebody who owned a, a, a series of prostitutes and this prostitute is making money like a pimp. And so every day she's making this money and she attaches herself to Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke and she begins following them. And every day she follows them as they go in and out of the city of Philippi. But she doesn't just follow. There seems to be something about her that is attracted to the spiritual nature of Paul and Silas. Something spiritually from the darkness that is holding her captive in all these areas of witchcraft is attracted to the Most High God in the person of Jesus. And so she begins to call out every day as she joins up with them, slaves of the Most High God. They proclaim to you a way of salvation, and she never ceased to say that, day after day after day. The scriptures tell us that Paul becomes annoyed by this. I'm not sure if Paul was annoyed by what she was saying. We don't really know if what she is saying is true. She's actually proclaiming a part of the gospel, or if she's twisting things. Or if she's just simply declaring that there's someone in the midst of many gods and the structure of God. She, after all, is attached to Apollo. But somehow in her proclamation of this, whatever her motives were and whatever's going on, Paul gets annoyed with that. I don't know if he's annoyed because he has compassion for her. He sees in her a slave girl who is bondage to this spirit, who is making money hand over fist for the mob who has no life, or if she is just causing him all kinds of just, you know, after a while, a little drip after a while is annoying. We don't really know. But he's had enough. And so he turns around and he says, in the name of Jesus, I command the spirit to come out of her. And it did. She was set free from the evil influence of the spirit. She is now rendered spiritually impotent. She can no longer tell the fortunes of people. She can no longer give insights into the spirit realm. She now is of no use to the mob. She has vacated her money-making profession for a group of people who are exploiting her. It is a fascinating story because when the owners of her see what had happened, they immediately apprehend Paul and Silas and the group, and they take them before the magistrates in the Agora, the marketplace. And there, there is a hearing. And the hearing is not that they cast a demon out of this girl that was this slave girl, who was considered not really a human being. She's a slave. Their beef is, these are rabble-rousing Jews. What was really going on was they disrupted their ability to make money and profit by exploiting people. So the charge is they're rabble-rousing Jews. They're scum. It's a, it's a demeaning term. Uh, they're, 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 you know, we, we, we know we could apply any one of the labels that would be common in our day and time when we speak in a derogatory sense towards a group of people. It's amazing because immediately the magistrates in the city strip them naked before all of the people. They beat them with rods. They throw them into prison where they are fastened in chains. What a turn of events. I don't know, but if you were Paul or Silas or Luke or Timothy, you were going to phone home to the wife, it probably would not be what you would say, this is a good day. Stripped naked, beaten, thrown in prison, fastened in stocks. That's where they end up. Their whole world is caving in on them. And they respond to this sudden series of events by about midnight fastened in chains, having backs that were beaten badly, and the 
heart of a prison, not knowing their fate, they began singing praises and offering prayers to God. I want you to think about that. A day that's gone horribly wrong. There's no reason for what has happened. There's no way to explain or to justify or to make sense of what's happened. They set a girl free. And now they themselves are prisoners facing an unknown future. The scriptures tell us that when they're done singing their praises and offering up their prayers, they weren't good Presbyterians. This were out loud. Everybody in the jail was listening. They could hear the singing. They could hear the prayers. They knew that there was something unique about these men. When suddenly an earthquake shakes and jolts the prison. The foundations of the prison are shaking, and yet the roof doesn't cave in. The bars that held them captive are open. The doors are open on the prison, but nothing falls in on it. And all of the shackles of the prisoners are released from them, and they are set free. No one is hurt. (laughs) I think if I were to phone home to the wife, I would say, the day looks like it's getting better. It was getting better for everyone but one person. There was one person in the story, the jailer, We don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. Probably jailers had seen so many prisoners come and go. Like most jailers, they would have ridiculed them. They probably would not have treated the prisoners nice. I don't imagine he was an instrument of grace and mercy. He'd seen so many people come and go. So many people deserving to be locked up. So many people deserving. He probably added to all of that. But he was given a specific charge. You keep these men safe. No doubt, he's heard the singing. What in the world? How can people who are in stocks and bonds in prison, awaiting an unknown future, how can they sing praises to some God? It's in the middle of the night, and the earth all of a sudden begins to shake and tremble, and the doors are open, and all the prisoners, he realizes that they're set free, and he realizes he has a catastrophe on his hands. He is responsible for the keeping of these prisoners and now they are free. How are you going to explain that? An earthquake came, but it didn't damage the prison. It just opened the doors and it unshackled the prisoners. Right. How do you explain that? And then there was the idea that had he mistreated any of them, They're now free. Prisoners in a riot situation don't necessarily treat their captors with kindness and grace. He sees what if he were going to phone home to his wife saying, I may be having the worst day of my life. And his solution is he takes out his own sword and he's going to end his life. It's the only alternative he could imagine. It's the only solution. This day is so bad. This situation is so bad. These things are so bad. My life is in such a bad place. My life is so ruined. My life is so in a mess that the best solution just take my own life. Forget there's a family back here, a household. I'm going to end my own life. Because if I don't, the authorities will end it for me for letting these prisoners go. And it won't be pretty. And just as he's ready to take his life, Paul calls over him and says, stop. We're all here. Nobody's left. We're all hanging out here. And so the, prison, the, 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 guard, the, the jailer, he takes lights and he goes in 
and he gets the prisoners, and he takes Paul and Silas out, and I'm sure trembling and trying to replay all the events is, what do I do to be saved? I ask you, what is he asking? For years and years and years, as I heard this text preach, I heard it preached as he's wanting to know how to go to heaven. That's not on his mind. It's the last thing on his mind. A minute ago, he was ready to take his own life without any sense of where his eternal destiny was going to be. He's in a mess. He doesn't know how it's going to be fixed. What's going to save me? What's going to rescue me? What's going to help me? Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your whole household. So the jailer takes them home. They preach the word there and the jailer believes and so does his family and they are baptized. And at the end of our account, we have an aristocratic woman and a jailer man who become the first convent, converts in the city of Philippi, in the seed for a church that is to be planted among a people who have no understanding of God. It's an amazing story. There's so many applications we could go, and I don't have time to go there with you, but there's a simple thing I want to get to this morning. It's in the essence of the question. What must I do? In the midst of life caving in, in the midst of a something dramatic that makes no sense whatsoever. I've heard that phrase a thousand times in my life of people who come to me whose lives have been shattered by something. This doesn't make sense. In the midst of that, they are singing praises. And they are offering prayers, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a jailer whose life is caving in, where it doesn't make sense, and everything is ruined, and everything is in disarray, wants to know, how can I have what you have? How can I do that as well? How do... How do we find life-giving power in Jesus for our lives? Or let me ask you this question. Maybe this is more important. How do we sing in prison? To me, that's the trigger of the whole thing. All of us find our ways into prison situations. The doctor drops some report of an illness on us that's overwhelming. We're faced with an unexpected loss of a loved one or a horrible death as a result of a long period of suffering. We're faced with the loss of a job and having to do life all over again. Perhaps some of us are finding the prison of broken relationships where marriage has gone bad or someone that you love has done something dramatically that has altered the landscape of your social life. You weep because one of your children is struggling so bad. Or perhaps you find yourself in jail because you've been the victim of some injustice or evil. Someone has done something to you that isn't right. Or perhaps you face some sort of financial crisis. And all of a sudden, life that was being lived seemingly for God, you find yourself in prison, in bondage, because those things are so powerful. They don't make sense. How do you sing when you're in prison? I would like to suggest to you today is the essence of true faith. It's behind the question, what must I do to be saved? And I tell you, 
believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It is so hard to believe when everything is going bad, when everything doesn't make sense, when you're asking and demanding answers to questions that there are no answers for. But believing in Jesus is not for the purpose of living comfortable lives in an environment that is conducive to our well-being. Believing in Jesus is to understand that he is Lord and that he sees us through the most difficult things in life and he promises us that he will lead and he will guide us and he will watch over us and he will care for us regardless of what we see. And ultimately, he reigns. It is trusting that in the midst of hardship and confusion and tragedy and contradiction that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and that your life has great significance. It is believing that and singing the praises and offering the prayers of that regardless of what it looks like. Let us pray. Almighty and loving God, we bless you for the gift of your word. We pray now for the grace to believe what we've heard and to live in ways that honor you above all. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you now join me in, in your program, in your bulletin, in the confession of our common faith in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. At this time, if our ushers would prepare themselves, we'd like to receive our morning offering. And uh, ushers, go ahead and wait on the people.
Would you join me in our prayer of thanksgiving? Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. I invite you now to join in the liturgy for our communion this day. Followers of Jesus, the Lord has prepared his table for all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation. All who sincerely believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and who desire to live in obedience to him as Lord are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord. As we prepare our table to be of service, we invite you to prepare your hearts by joining together. You may remain seated, but joining together in the hymn, Spirit of the Living God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. With joy we give you praise, gracious God, for you created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and kept covenant with us, even when we fell into sin. We give you thanks for Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his life, death, and resurrected opened up to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we join our voices with all of the saints and angels and the whole creation to proclaim the glory of your name. We give you thanks, loving Father, that our Savior Jesus Christ, before he suffered, gave us this memorial of his sacrifice until he comes again. At his last supper, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks and broke it, he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He also took a cup after supper, and said, do this in remembrance of me, for this is my blood of a new covenant which is given to you and to others for the remission of sin. Often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Therefore, we proclaim our faith, signed and sealed, in this sacrament. Christ is alive, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Living God, send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we and all your saints be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and love. Gather your whole church, O Lord, into the glory of your kingdom. Let us join together now in the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This bread that we break, is a sharing of the body of Christ. We 
and this cup for which we give thanks is a sharing of the blood of Christ. Our table is now open. Let us be nourished and strengthened in the table of the Lord.
blood of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. Amen. Let's pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for uniting us by baptism in the body of Christ, for filling us with joy in the Holy Supper of our Lord. Lead us into active participation in the ministry of Jesus. Send us out to live as changed people because we've shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Now that we've tasted the banquet that you've prepared for us in the world to come, may we all one day share together the inheritance of the saints in the life of the holy city. call you to service. Keep alert and stand firm in your faith. Be courageous and be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Amen. And now as I send you forth with the blessing of God, may you go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, grant you his peace. May we be a people that learn how to sing from prison because we are faithful to 
the Lord our God. Go in peace, for we are.